the industries that are represented on the panel here, medical devices and, and food, um, are certainly two industries that are, that are uh, you know, extremely in the crosshairs in terms of making sure they can produce quality product. Um, Michael, maybe to start with you, uh, to, to what extent do you think um, you know, the adoption of Industry 4.0 and, and data analytics is, is, is being driven by the regulatory requirements or being slowed down by, you know, regulatory, um, uh, you know, kind of complexity in, in the pharmaceutical industry? Do you have any comments on that? I think if you look at, uh, you, if you look at regulatory organizations like the FDA, they see that they're moving at pace as well because yeah. they see that all the companies that are responsible to report to them are moving on because you've got new technologies, you've additive manufacturing, you know, it's a different world and everybody has to move forward. But at the same time, regulation is, dif is difficult. And, and to find, you know, CSV engineers in this country, they're like hen's teeth. Mm. So even if you've got some great ideas and you want to put them into, ma into operation, there is a lead time to implement that in a regulated environment and sometimes it will stop projects. Yeah. Um, so it's about, again, it's about that maturity of, of, of saying regulation is, is part and parcel of a project, bake it into the timeline um, and work with the regulatory authorities because they're moving forward with analytics of their own. Yeah. They're looking to blockchain and they're looking to big data and, uh, and all these technologies to improve how they regulate environments. So I think everybody has to move, move forward together, but the key thing is they do need to move forward. And you think that... The companies who are coming with the, the big red button that you described maybe sometimes don't appreciate the complexity of, of that, that regulatory environment that with, with, in which, I mean, apart from the fact that maybe the wires aren't there to connect up, maybe some of the, of the kind of solutions haven't taken into account the, the regulatory complexity within the, within the medtech farm industry. Yeah, I, I, well, I, I think it's a double-edged sword because a lot of the companies that are coming to you predominantly work in that space. So if they don't know about it, then they shouldn't be in that space. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, I think they're more caught out by the fact that um, your company just isn't wired up. Uh, and the other companies then, I think, maybe that are breaking into, into that space, it's, it's a different animal. You know, mm. like I've, I worked in, I've worked in uh, electronic consumer and I've worked in a regulated environment and the speed to uh, technology adoption is, is very, very different because you don't have the, the regulatory onus on you in, in the electronic sector. If you know, if I sell you a computer and the hard drive fails, I'll just give you a bigger hard drive. Yeah, do recall, yeah. But you know, if I give you a hip that's faulty, that's a different animal. Yeah. Uh, so I think new entrants have to take a bit of time. Existing entrants, I think, they seem to struggle with the fact that most, manufact most supply chains are not wired up digitally yet. Yeah, okay, very good. And, and Darren, I mean, you, you talked about the food sector and the, the massive uh, negative consequences that, that, that can, can happen from people not being in control of, of, of their quality processes and, and, the, and the safety issues that creates for, for consumers. I mean, do you, how do you see from your perspective, I mean, you, you've worked with, in, with regulatory agencies in the US, how do you see them moving in that context and how do they work with, with big, massive multinational companies who maybe have the resources to invest versus the, the mom and pop shops and, and, the, and the local um, food providers that, that are out there and are, are growing all the time now in the industry? Well, I think, and I love the bridge image you showed at the end, the idea that if you're not going, the bridge will move. I don't think that we're going to find one day that someone doesn't want, you know, we're not selling or buying uh, rice or potatoes or beef. That's mm -hmm. not what we're looking at. We're looking at the idea that consumers themselves uh, have evolved such that consumers are expecting to be able to find information about that product or about that company online or to scan a, a, a QR code or to, to find information, to find where it came from, when was it picked, how is it certified, uh, does it meet these auditing standards. That is the kind of shift in culture. I mean, look at today. How many people leave feedback for a, a, a Lyft or Uber or a eBay or Amazon? We want to leave feedback. We want to get... We want to see these feedback. We want this with our food now. Uh, and, and the next generation of consumers, the next generation of people who are working in this industry are going to be faced with the idea that not only is it a more complex industry that is um, experiencing changes in the regulatory requirements for that product, but the fact that the consumers themselves want to have that information stake, a, a two-way direction information stake, as a stakeholder that can find out information about that and that can provide the impetus for we want it this way or we want this information. And I think that 
those small companies, those mom and pop restaurants or, or, or small farms, they're going to have a very difficult challenge mm. in terms of those economic barriers to market, to, to get on the shelves at that retailer. But I do think that there are solutions out there. And at some point, we will be able to see that diverse participation within the market. I just think that the overall shift in awareness, like the bridge, if we don't adapt to the change of the consumer culture, then we're going to be left high and dry. <laughs> you uh, That's my wife laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Guillermo, maybe you want to touch a little bit on, on the difference. I mean, you talked a little bit about the adoption of open source technology and, and so on. I mean, do you want to talk about the difference in, in what you perceive as, as the, because um, you've worked in a number of different sectors, the adoption yeah. rate of open source technology in different industries? Yeah, basically at the moment I'm most involved in uh, healthcare, uh, but I can feel the difference in terms of uh, uh, mindset uh, on open source. While in healthcare, uh, there is this uh, openness to open source saying, uh, we have to solve some problems, save lives, improve things, let's see if there is something ready to production. I can feel the same in manufacturing, and this is not restricted to Ireland only. I'm talking about uh, different places in Europe. I'm coming three months ago from a conference in Germany where the con concept of Industry 4.0 has been born, and uh, lots of interesting ideas there. Uh, they realized that there are no open standards yet. So this, I think, is key uh, to, uh, if you want to talk really on Industry 4.0, otherwise you have silos, islands, and the same applies to open source. So there is a lot of work uh, to be done on the, this space. Otherwise, these ideas will stay as ideas, not as uh, something that you could leverage to production. Mm -hmm. Good. And, and Ricardo, just w one question for you as well. I mean, in terms of, I mean, Cedar is a great example of this kind of idea of open innovation and companies collaborating. Do you see the need to do more of that in Ireland? Are we already well progressed in that context in terms of pr promoting collaboration across sectors, across industries? You know, the mom and pop, the small companies yeah. to the large, or, or, is, or do we need no, to do in, more? Uh, in Ireland, we are lucky because uh, there is also the IT industry is uh, so big that it's influencing also other things like manufacturing. It happens with banking, finance is a more closest world, so I'm confident that Ireland could drive uh, this program then uh, propagate to across Europe or uh, elsewhere. That was a fantastic answer. <laughs> <laughs> the pressure off Ricardo there. No, I'd say in terms of Cedar, uh, we do a lot of uh, these you know, kind of networking activities, particularly just to do this, you know, to actually cooperate in you know, big projects there. But the thing is just we experience this um, kind of necessity because a lot of companies come and for example, for the last two years, we have a lot of industry 4.0 uh, companies, for example, in oil, oil and gas and energy, coming and, and, and basically saying, we have this data, what do we do with that? Yeah. So we sit down with them, and we have to actually do a brainstorming session and come up with ideas. So we tell them, what are your business goals? What, do you, what are your problems? What do you want to achieve? And then we come forward with this kind of solution for them. Because many of the companies seem to me that are lost Obviously, others, you know, I don't know, maybe Johnson Johnson or, or Optum, you know, they are well in track. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But others and small companies, they need just to interact more, you know. I don't know, Cedar is a great example of innovation, but there are plenty of, of, of companies out there and, and, and centers. Yeah. But I think, I think, you know, organizations like, like you know, the events like this and organizations like your own and, and that C group as well can help perhaps some learnings between companies as well, pr promote some, some learnings from the, the companies that are more advanced to, to ones that are, are really just starting on this journey and are, are just, um, you know, as, as, as Mike was saying, just, just starting. They feel the wall is quite high, but they... Well, yeah, totally. But still, others. you know, I can see that, for example, companies like uh, I don't know, Optum and Johnson & Johnson, they use us for particular niches that they want to actually explore. So perhaps, you know, they are, you know, very good in data analytics and they are using deep learning up to an extent, but they want to go into predictive maintenance, applying this, and they don't have the skills there at that moment. So they use us. And what we have seen, for example, with one of the companies in oil and gas, they came to us, they have zero data scientists. Uh, they ask us to do a project and then to kind of work with them to bring data analytics uh, and, you know, kind of stuff into their company. So now I think they have within a year, five data scientists working from zero to five, yeah. which I think is good, you know, we help them cool. with that. It was a boots board a few years ago uh, about uh, it's a black data, so when you have data in house, but don't know what you do, but uh, now in manufacturing, it thinks this boots board uh, <laughs> could be used, uh, looking at the experience uh, uh, shared by Ricardo, so <laughs> we could talk about black data. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, folks, I'm just conscious of time. I have a big red light flashing at me here. Are there any burning questions from the, from the floor? Or can we let our, our panel go today? 
If not, I'd like if you could uh, if you could thank them in the in the traditional way um, for for the for the contribution today. Mm. Thank you.